Y'all brought something to wrap up in today, didn't you? <laughs> Good. They may run. All right, let's begin. It's right at 10 o'clock, and I tell you I start promptly at 10. Have a lot to cover. We're, co uh, we're uh, going to cover chapters 14, 15, and 16. Go on and put on the screen that part that says uh, Revelation 15, 16. It's the brown picture. That's it. That's it. We'll do 14, 15, and 16. Okay, let's open in prayer. Our Almighty God, we come to you this morning. We gather in this sanctuary, Lord Jesus. We open your beautiful word, Lord, and we read and take heed to the words transcribed on those pages, Lord. We want to learn all the precepts that you have recorded for us. We want to know what is going to happen to, at the end of the time, at the end of age, Lord. And I pray that my teaching and the message that I'm to teach will be a blessing to those that hear it. Anoint me, Lord. Help me to portray what is in this beautiful word of revelation, Lord. May we take it in, may we ponder it and record it in our minds. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, we're going to begin with chapter 14, so you can uh, open your uh, Bible to that or just look at your handouts. And guess what I did? Numbered, <laughs> numbered your handouts. Because some said, where is she? What is she talking about? So you now have a number for each of the handouts. Now, Revelation 14, does that one have a handout? Make sure you have a handout. Okay, Revelation 14. This opens with, then I looked. 
then I looked, said John. So anytime you read that word then in scripture, it means there is a change or a moving away from the previous chapter to a new subject matter. So in the previous chapter we studied last week was that unholy trinity made up of Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. And now we have a scene of a lamb, and that lamb is always Jesus Christ. And then we have a group of individuals, a 144,000 individuals. Now look at verse 1. Then, that's John, I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads so here scriptures tells us where this scene is taking place it is on mount zion and this is a heavenly mount zion and a synonym for it would be the earthly jerusalem this scene in chapter 4 is not on earth but john sees this scene in heaven and he and of course have you heard of mount zion it is a very important place that we read of in scripture. So there's a place on earth also called Mount Zion. Other, another name for it is the city of Jerusalem where the temple was built. Always the home of the reigning king referred to as the city of David. And this is what is so important. And when Jesus returns at the end of the seven years, he returns to this place, Mount Zion, and it says he will plant his feet in this city. And he, Christ, will rule and reign from Mount Zion. So it is a very important place in prophecy. Now, who was standing on Mount Zion in our scene, in the heavenly scene? Well, there's a group of 144,000 Jewish men. And why do I think they're Jewish? It's because they came from the 12 tribes of Israel. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes makes up the number of 144,000 men. And what is their role during the tribulation? As they live through the tribulation, what will these 144,000 men be doing? These men will be evangelists who will preach and spread the good news of Jesus Christ all over the globe. That is their role during the tribulation. Now, how can they be identified? They have the stamp of God, it says, on their foreheads. Now, we've already talked about a mark, a mark or a stamp on a group of people, and that was the mark of the Antichrist, which the number was 666. Here we see a stamp on the foreheads of these 144,000 evangelists. And the reason they've been stamped or have that sign on them is for protecting and preserving them during that horrific time of the tribulation. And so here we basically see this scene in heaven on Mount Zion. And how many of those evangelists died during the tribulation? Not a single one, because you, we see the entire group of 144,000, and they're in heaven. So they were preserved and protected during the tribulation. They started with 144,000 and were ending with 144,000. And then verse 2 says... And I, John, heard a voice from heaven, like the sound or the voice of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. So here John is looking toward heaven, and he sees this lamb. He sees these 144,000 sealed men who stood, they're standing there with Jesus. Jesus is always the lamb that we read of in scripture. But he also heard a voice, and this is how he described it. It's the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And so 
this identifies this speaker that, that John hears this voice as the one who spoke from the midst of those seven lampstands that we talked about and studied in chapter one. And so this is the same kind of voice and that voice was Jesus Christ, the lamb. And so this is the voice of the Lord, but he hears the music of harps. Now we know those harps are beautiful ancient instruments that were uh, that accompanied uh, the, ch the children of Israel as they would sing, they would have harps to play along with their songs. Now verse three says, as they were singing a new song, notice it was a new song, before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So here we're still in this heavenly scene and they were these they are singing of the there was the singing of the harpers accompanied by their harps and they are singing a new song and look who they're singing it to they're in the throne room because remember I taught you those four living creatures are always near the throne room of God and the elders and that represented the church from the rapture now who are these harpers well, we're going to read about them again in chapter 15, verse 2. They are those, it says in chapter 15, those who stand on the sea of glass mingled with fire. Before the throne, it says, with the harps of God in their hands. And these are going to be, these are the same 144,000 that we're going to talk about in chapter 15. But it says they sing a new song. This song is a double song, if you notice. It's called the Song of Moses, and we know that was the Old Testament song. And then they're going to sing a song of the Lamb, and that's the New Testament song that they're singing in that throne room in front of the elders and the four living creatures and Jesus Christ. We're told no one could learn that song but the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Why are they the only ones that can sing these songs? Because they have been delivered from the beast during that horrible time of the tribulation and they were saved and they were saved only by the blood of the lamb because they're marked with God's seal on their foreheads. And so during that horrific time of tribulation, they came out victorious. They were vic the victorious ones. And only they could sing this song of their testimony. And what was their testimony? That they were saved and they were redeemed from the earth by the blood of the Lamb. And so these 144 are singing the a song of redemption. Now let's identify who these 144,000 are. Verse 4 said, It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. And also verse 5 says, And in their mouth no lie was found for they are blameless. So let's identify and see what these characteristics are of these Jewish evangelists. Number one, it says they are not defiled with women. Now this means that God will keep these men pure and not defiled by the sins of the world that were during the sins that were going on during the tribulation. They will have resisted that perverse system of the Antichrist and they will resist any temptation to sex. They are undefiled and they're true to the Lamb and they will keep their vows to the Lamb. And that's what it's meant when they are virgins. Number two says another characteristic is these 144,000. These will follow the Lamb. This speaks of the loyalty to the Lamb, Jesus. Whatever the cost, this chosen class of men, they are loyal and faithful to.
to Jesus Christ. Number three says these have been redeemed as first fruits of the Lamb. Well, do you know what that means? Well, if you've studied any in the Old Testament, uh, we have the sacrificial system of Old Testament um, offerings that were always offered to God, and they had to be the best of the crops. They had to be the first of the crops, and it was a symbol of a harvest to come. So this says these are first fruits of the Lamb. So this speaks of the first fruits of a redeemed Israel and more converts will follow. So this statement is telling us that these may be the first Jewish people to be saved during the tribulation. They're known as the first fruits and that's what it meant in the Old Testament, the best and the first. Also, it says, and many other Jews will follow because there's a harvest that will come. And so they think this is many Jews will follow and be saved because they are called the first fruits. And then another characteristic is they, no lie was found for they are blameless, truthful, steadfast men and they speak God's truth accurately and precisely. These are the four characteristics of the identity of this group of 144,000. And you can see these on handout number one called the characteristics of the 144,000. And I've just listed and spelled out for that. Um, and look at the bottom, 144,000 on Mount Zion bear the name of God. The unbelieving world carries that name and number of 666 of the satanic beast. The destiny of every person is determined by the mark that person wears, bears. So when judgment comes, there will be no room for doubt and uncertainty because people will have the mark that declared who their master was. If you have the mark of the 666, we know who your master is. If you have that sign of God on your forehead, then you belong to Jesus Christ. And so that's the first section of chapter 14. Moving right along to handout number two, these are called or divine announcements. Divine announcements, seven revelations from the heavenlies. The first announcement, and that we're gonna see the scene of three angels on our screen. They are. This was just, I just sent this to Brandon this morning at 8 o'clock, and he got it up there for me. So this is a very unusual text that there are going to be angels that will be, as I've said on the handout, making announcements. Yeah, the divine announcements. God can do anything he wants to. So he's going to use angels to make announcements for him during this dark days of the tribulation. Now, the first, looking at... Uh, the divine announcements made by the seven angels. Another word for angel is messenger. And that is what we're gonna see with these angels at work. They are flying directly overhead, which it means it is our sky, where it, which has the sun and the moon, for all to see and hear these three angels. And it says then, so you see, I'm, I think in my mind, okay, I'm changing from what I've just studied to a new scene. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an internal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. So we have this angel direct flying overhead. What is the mission of this angel? It is to preach the eternal gospel. And that is the angel's message. The, the message is fear God for the hour of his judgment has come. And this is the only place in scripture where an angel is commissioned to preach the gospel. And gospel, we know, means good news. So the angel is preaching that God saves by the forgiveness of sin and opens his kingdom to all who repent. Jesus will go to great lengths to give the world one last chance 
to be saved. And he doesn't want any to perish. So this angel is preaching an internal message of the gospel. And look who he's preaching it to. Everyone, to every tribe and nation, language and people. All people groups will hear this angel while they're living during the last days of the tribulation. Then there's another angel flying overhead. And he's the same angel said with a loud voice, the same angel with this message said, this is his message, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So this is what this angel is preaching. Will the people heed this gospel message? I thought to myself, they really have rejected a human messenger here on earth. So where will they take heed to what this angel is preaching, an angel messenger in the tribulation? And so uh, the, this reads, verse three, 7 reads, the angel flying overhead preaches, fear God and give him glory. And do not fear Satan, the false prophet, but fear God. In other words, have a holy reverence for God, a holy respect for him. Why? For the hour of the judgment has come. And he is warning them as the last moment arrives, they best repent and believe God before his breath is about to be poured out in those bold judgments. And the word of judgment is the same word as wrath. And so the same scripture says not only to fear God, but to worship him. Because he made heaven and earth, and he made the sea and the springs of water. In other words, worship him as creator. Just look around, and creation is the proof of God for all people to believe him. And so he says, fear God, but worship him as the great creator. And during this tribulation, people, period, people have two choices. You're going to believe the Antichrist, believe his lies, and worship him, or your other choice will be fear God alone, give him all the glory, for he is the father of all creation of the universe. Two choices. And then you have another angel, a second angel sent by God, remember, and he this message from this second angel is, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And here this angel is pronouncing judgment on Babylon and its doom. Now we're going to study this in detail next week, chapters 17 and 18 about Babylon. The question is, and I've read so many scholars, and they all, many of them uh, do not agree on this, but is Babylon an actual city that's going to be rebuilt during the tribulation period? Or is this a referral to a system of worldwide political, economic, and religious kingdom of the Antichrist? Is it an actual city, or it's going to be the system that the Antichrist will operate from? If it's an actual city, let me say, it's the city of Satan. Witchcraft, astrology, and, any, and all the other occult practices, a demonic city, a demonic city controlled by the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then... So regardless if it's a system or city, we're going to go in depth in that next week. Regardless, the kingdom of that Antichrist and who is the enforcer of this satanic false religion in the world that's going to come upon the world, it will be the Antichrist who's been empowered and given the power and authority through Satan. And that kingdom, according to the announcement of this angel, is Babylon, Babylon will fall. 
And so it's a warning. The angel gives a warning to the nations and says, do not become intoxicated with her pleasures. And the words we used in scripture says, words were do not drink of her sexual immorality or enter into the rebellion that she offers through her hatred and idolatry toward God. And next week too, and the angel's warning, and we're gonna see this in chapter 18, verse four, says the angel's warning that God's people might hear his voice, and this is what God tells the people. Come out of her, speaking of Babylon, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin, and you receive not her plagues. Come out of her, my people. So God always warns the people of every nation, tribe, language, and people, the people on the earth. He warned of this system of Babylon. So my question is, do we partake of this, and it's called sexual immorality, do we partake of that today in our world? We should take heed of that warning today as the evil and the wickedness of our world. And God says, come out and stand as a separate people, my special chosen people, come out and worship me. And then we have a third angel. Have you ever even heard of the angels flying overhead? Well, this is God's word. And so uh, he is sending these angels as his messengers. He loves the people, he warns the people, and he's trying to draw as many as he can because judgment is about here. And so another angel, the third one followed them saying with a loud voice, you notice it's a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, now here is the third angel flying in the air and makes this most awful announcement, which is a warning to those who worship the Antichrist or who worship his image. Now, these are his followers, the Antichrist followers. Now, how are they gonna worship the Antichrist? Well, he is actually going to make an image of himself, a large statue of some kind, in the temple in Jerusalem. And so people will be forced by that false prophet to worship this Im image, which is worshiping him and not even thinking of the Almighty God. But the Antichrist wants to be worshiped as God, as the little God. And so, how are these followers identified? It tells us the mark on their foreheads or their right hand. So the number 666, which is the mark of the one world economy, the Antichrist will force everyone, small and great, rich and poor, to be given a mark on the right hand or their forehead and no one could buy or sell anything without that mark. So it is one's ticket to business. And then verse 10, we're still in uh, talking about that third angel. And it says, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. That sounds foreboding, doesn't it? And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, as you read and study, ask yourself questions. So here you should say, who is this he? He will drink the wine. Who is this he? Who are they referring to? The he is the one who worships the Antichrist and has the mark of the beast. That who, who this he is. And it says, following the Antichrist and worshiping him will stir up the wrath of God. Anyone loyal to the Antichrist and his kingdom will suffer the outpouring of God's wrath. This figure of the cup of God's wrath is used to convey God's terrible, horrible judgment. And notice his wrath is poured in full strength. 
not diluted one little bit, full strength. And this just to suggests the undiluted wrath of God. Oh, yes, he's a God of love, beautiful God of love, but he is also a God of wrath. And this that he sees that's happening in the kingdom of the Antichrist stirs his anger toward these people. And so here it's, it's, it's poured full strength, undiluted, and done with the full force of God's divine anger on those who follow the beast. And this is the response of a righteous God against sin. Now on one side, we see uh, he will be tormented, it says, scripture, with fire and sulfur. Uh, the one who follows the Antichrist. How will he be tormented? With fire and brimstone. Those two words are always associated with the torment of divine punishment. This is a reference to hell and the lake of fire. And then he, the Antichrist, will is the worshiper, will be tormented. And it's, look where they're going to be tormented. It says in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. So the angels had warned them. And the lamb had died for them on the cross. And yet they will suffer in front of of these very ones who tried to save them. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast, it says in its image, whoever sees the mark of its name. So this scripture tells us who is in the lake of fire. Those worshipers of the Antichrist and its image, the one that has that mark on their right hand or forehead. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. This is speaking of the lake of fire. Where are these worshipers in the, of the Antichrist? They're, this is a reference to the eternal hell that they will be in. This is an un, infliction of an unbearable pain where the worm never dies and fire never ends, a place beyond our imagination full strength undiluted lake of fire and brimstone their torment will be misery and doom and helplessness and hopelessness so the smoke of their torment never ends the man's doom is fixed forever once they take their mark there's no turning back so now let's move from that everlasting hell that was put on the unbelievers and God is putting in his beautiful scripture a call for the endurance for those believers can you believe there will be believers living to the, during the tribulation to this, to, during this time so now this is speaking to them uh, and it speaks of the patience of the saints here those who patiently it says keep the commandments of God or well, that's a believer those believers in Jesus must endure, persevere, even in difficult times of the tribulation, and they must remain faithful, even to their death, and they will receive a very special divine blessing. And verse 13 says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Do you remember last week I gave you a sheet called the Beatitudes of Revelation? Now we have Beatitudes in Matthew, but there were seven Beatitudes on a handout that are given throughout the book of Revelation. And so this is the second one on that handout. And it says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. What does that mean? You're blessed if you die. It, it says, this meaning is, it may be better, it may be the time when it is better for the saved people trying to live to, through that horrible, horrendous time of tribulation. It may be best for them just to die, it says, rather than live. Because they were gonna leave their pain and their suffering and all the grief they endure on the earth. 
and then they're going, it says, to heaven, and it says, if you'll look, that they will rest from their labors. And they're going to, and their deeds will follow them. If their deeds follow them, now your deeds do not get you in heaven, but your deeds will follow them, and their deeds will be rewarded. And these people probably will receive the martyr's crown. And so I wrote in my notes, it is better to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and that's going to happen over in the millennial reign. It's better to endure and live and believe in Jesus Christ than to worship and follow the Antichrist for these three and a half years. It's better to reign with Jesus Christ in the millennial for a thousand years. And so those were the, uh, one of the Beatitudes on your sheets. And now, did you realize, if you've read your scripture, chapter 14, Verse uh, verse 14, I mean verse uh, 14 through 20, this section of chapter 14 is referring to Armageddon. Did you realize that when you read and studied? We're talking, we're going to talk about two kinds of judgments and two kinds of reaping of the earth. The first is the harvest of the grain. And the second judgment is the vintage of the grapes. So here in this section of chapter 14, we're talking about judgments, and this is the same as the Armageddon. You're going to also see it in chapter 16 when we get there about Armageddon. And then the third reference in the book of Revelation will be over in chapter 19 about that campaign and that war called Armageddon. But here we see it in chapter 14, first passage. Now, this first judgment is called the harvest of the grain. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And this is a picture of the judgment of men on earth. Verse 14 says, And then I, John, looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now here, let's find these are three factors given to us in this scripture to identify who this is on the cloud. The first, it says, he's seated on the cloud like the Son of Man. So the Lord on the cloud uh, shows his majesty. The Lord, the Son of Man on the cloud, shows his majesty. And look what he has with a golden crown. Well, he's the king, and that's what kings wear. And he will come as the triumphant conqueror out of heaven to prevail over his enemies. And that's what that's showing here. And in his hand is a sharp sickle. This sickle is a harvesting tool with a very sharp razor, razor sharp iron blade used by ancient farmers to cut the grain. It represents swift, swift and devastating judgment. And verse 15 says, And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe this is the end of the tribulation toward the end of the tribulation and it says the earth is fully ripe so let's see what this means so this angel came from the heavenly temple tells us that tells the lord to put in your sickle and reap this refers to the judgment of men on earth. The hour has come, and the ungodly people of the world is ready to be gathered up and judged. So this refers to the harvest of the earth, which is ripe. It shows God will withhold his judgment until the very end. But then, when it is time, it is time. And so he will put in his sickle and cut the grain of the earth. Now Jesus compared this uh, 
this type of harvest end of age to a harvest and the angels were the harvesters. They would separate the wheat from the tares and the tares would be burned up. Burn up the chaff with a fire that is unquenchable, it said. Let them both grow together until harvest, but at harvest time, I will tell the reapers to gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. That's the parable in Matthew 13, the wheat and the tares. That's a reference here to this harvest of the earth that's going on in chapter 14. 14. And so verse 16 says, So he who sat on the cloud, we've already identified him as the son of man, swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Or another way to say that, judgment came on the people. At the end of the age, Jesus will swing his sickle over the earth. Many will beg and plead and cry out, but it's too late. He will take multitudes that never, ever called upon him as Savior and Lord of their lives. And he will cast them into the everlasting fire of damnation. And that's the judgment of the harvest of the grain of the earth. But there's another judgment, and it's called the vintage of the grapes. Now, vintage has to do with the vine. And so the vine, on the vine, are clusters of grapes. Now, this says, verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. This angel came out of the heavenly dwelling place of God with a sharp sickle, and it says, And another angel came out from the altar. So we have several angels coming out of that temple. And this one says, verse 18, and another angel came out of the altar. The angel who had authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the grapes from the vine of the earth. For its grapes are ripe. Now why, and that's why this is called the vintage of the grapes. The other was the harvest of the earth. And so this angel, it says, came from the altar. Well, if you took my temple study with me, this was a very important piece of furniture in the temple on earth, but it's also in heaven. It's a beautiful golden altar called the altar of incense. And on this altar, they constantly would feed the fire And it would have beautiful incense that would go up to the Lord, this altar of incense in heaven. And usually the priests would continually burn incense. And this altar of incense represented the prayers of the saints. So it's mentioned here in our scripture that that there is an angel who is over this uh, altar. And this angel uh, was told to put in your sickle, his sickle, now, this is a, uh, different from that long blade. This is a, uh, the long blade was used to cut the grain, but this is a small knife, if you've ever seen one, and it's used to cut the grapes clusters. And so the angels told to gather the clusters of the earth from the earth's vines. Gather the clusters of the grapes from the earth's vines because its grapes are ripe. And so he gathered the grape harvest of the earth. So we see judgment going on in this passage of scripture. In verse 19, so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The angel gathered, this angel gathered the enemies of God who are still alive at the end of age. They are facing their destruction at Armageddon. Here's an image of an angel throwing the vintage or the cluster of the grapes into the great wine press, it's called, 
and that is of the wrath of God. This is an image of a horrendous slaughter or bloodbath that will take place. This is of the Lord's wrath to slaughter the enemies of God who are still alive. And this is called the vintage of the grapes when the enemies are gathered. And the Lord is the one who is, now they're putting the grapes in the wine press. It's just an image of that. And the Lord is the one who is doing the stomping on people, not grapes. And so what pours out is their blood. And so verse 20 says, and the wine press where the grapes were put in and pressed and stomped on and juice came out and the wine press was trodden outside of the city and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 furlongs so let's see what this scripture is telling us uh, this states that the blood from the wine press was as high as the horse's bridle well i'm not sure this would be the case but it may be just an exaggeration to reveal the extent of this slaughter of the people still alive on the earth so much blood from the killing of the enemies of god and here we have a picture of the war of armageddon the ripe grapes are the wicked nations who will be trampled in the wine press of God's wrath. The wine press, it said, was outside the city. Well, that city is a reference to Jerusalem because God wants to protect that city of Jerusalem, that beautiful Mount Zion, from the carnage that is all around in the Palestine, Palestine area. Now, as a reference of the blood as high as the horse's bridle, I think everyone in this sanctuary has heard that. So, that would be four feet high. So, I think this is saying that judgment is so fierce and intense that blood could splash as high as the horse's bridle. But actually, to rise up four feet may be an exaggeration. But it definitely could splash on the horse's bridle. There will be so much bloodshed at this war or campaign of Armageddon. And it says it will be uh, for 1,600 furlongs. And this is approximately 200 miles. And so millions and millions will die in the land of Palestine. There will be so much blood from the stomping of God's wrath. The entire land of Israel is drenched in blood. And guess what the length of Israel is? From the top, that is up Megiddo in the top, the north, to the south, the place called Edom, is about 184 miles. And so the scripture says, uh, 1600 furlongs which would be estimated about 200 miles and so this is saying that the entire land of israel will be involved in that war of armageddon from megiddo in the north to edom in the south about 184 miles and so look at your handout on the seven i just wrote this up because armageddon we hear about it a lot we're not real sure what it is but i told you what armageddon is on your number three handout. It is the climatic war of the great tribulation when all the armies of the earth gather to attack and attempt to finally eradicate and destroy all the Jewish people. That's been Satan's desire in his heart from the very beginning. And to this very end of time, he will still try to uh, kill all the Jewish people. That's what Armageddon is. And as I said, it's not a single battle, but it's a war campaign. And look at the titles. The Day of the Lord's Vengeance, Isaiah. The Winepress of God, that's Isaiah and Joel. The Great and Awesome Day of the Lord, that's Joel. The Harvest, Joel really talks about Armageddon. The Day, like burning like a furnace, that's Malachi. 
the great and terrible day of the Lord, that's Malachi. The war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Those are references to the campaign in war of Armageddon. Okay, and that is all of chapter 14. And now we're going to have a picture of the seven uh, angels on the screen. We're moving into the final uh, judgments that will be on the earth. So you can turn to your Bible, chapter 15. I think I'm going to get through today. You know, last week I had to rush to get through, but I think I'm going to make it today. So we're, you have a handout number four, and this is regarding chapter uh, 15, the seven angels. No, the, the picture of the angels. No. That's it. Good. Those are seven angels. Thank you, Cindy, operating this. Those are the seven angels. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Seven angels. with, But it's not pretty what they're doing, but just the angels themselves. So chapter 15, and John saw seven angels. All right, chapter 15 introduces the seven bowls of wrath. It should have been combined with chapter 16 that we're going into next. These two, two chapters uh, regard the final judgments at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Man put the 15 as a separate chapel, chapter. Really, 15 and 16 should come together as one chapter. So the bold judgments will come in rapid succession, each one stronger in fury and intensity as they are poured out. Now look at the chart on the screen. We'll leave the angels and we'll go to the chart. That chart. Now thus far in our study, so last semester and this semester, in the seven year period, remember three and a half years in the beginning of the tribulation, three and a half years in the second part of the tribulation, uh, John has told us about the opening of the seven seals. And you see them on the screen. They were the first judgments in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And then we heard the sounding of the seven trumpets. Now, I believe, and, I, and many disagree with me, but I believe the trumpet judgments also happened in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Could have been right there in the middle part, but those are the trumpets, and you could hear the sounding of those trumpets. And now we see the pouring out of the seven bowls of the wrath of God. There are 21 separate, distinct judgments that follow a sequence. They are divinely appointed by God. They will begin, remember, tribulation, seven years, begins with the signing of the covenant between the Jewish people and the Antichrist. He is a man that's promised them, them peace, and he will sign a covenant with the Jewish people. And then the judgment of the tribulation will end with the coming of Jesus Christ. That's going to be in chapter 19, at the end of the seven years. And so thus far, if you remember, the uh, one-fourth of mankind died during the seal judgments, a fourth were killed. And then you have the trumpet judgments and a third of the mankind of mankind died during the trumpet judgment. So if you add the one fourth and one third, a little over half of the population has already lost their lives due to the seal and trumpet judgments. And so now we're moving into the worst judgments of all, and those are the bold judgments. And verse 1, chapter 15 says, And then I saw another sign in heaven. And here, go back to the scene of the angels. Yes. And then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and amazing, it says. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last for with them the wrath of God is finished. Now here is the third sign 
of the three great signs that we see in heaven. If you remember the very first sign we studied, that remember this is apocalyptic literature and it's just full of signs and symbols. So we have to decide and, and determine what the sign is revealing to us. Well, the first sign we studied was that sun clothed woman who represented Israel and she gave forth a, a birth to a male child and that was Jesus. The second sign, if you remember that, ugly seven-headed great red dragon was satan and now this is the first third sign it's seven angels with seven plagues these will bring on the full wrath of god now i saw it said verse two what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside that sea of glass with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of lamb now in chapter 4 we're talking about the throne room in chapter 4 we had a beautiful picture of the throne room and before the throne was a sea of glass you remember that beautiful picture with my favorite chapter chapter four god on his throne and on, in the throne room the canopy of the throne room is a beautiful rainbow with all the beautiful colors of ruby and green beautiful and diamonds but the flooring of that throne room was something called the sea of glass and it was crystal clear it said can you imagine it said it was like a diamond reflecting those beautiful colors of the throne room the rainbow colors upon that sea of glass it's called and now in chapter 15 john sees it not crystal clear but he calls it a fiery surface on this sea of glass this symbolizes the fire fiery trials of the occupants occupants who are standing on that sea of glass the occupants of the sea of glass came out of the great tribulation, the last part of the seven years. And they have gotten the victory over the beast and his image, and now they're standing. In other words, they lived through the tribulation and now are transported into heaven to the throne room of the God. Now, what else did John see? They have harps. And they sing two songs, one of Song of Moses. That was Moses saying that in the Old Testament when, the, when he led the people of Israel across the Red Sea. And they came out on the other side jubilant and singing. It's called the Song of Moses. The other is the Song of the Lamb. That's New Testament. And um, as the Israelites, they had redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So the harpers of chapter 14 that we just talked about are the same ones here the sealed ones with God's mark and they're singing these two songs and they're standing on the fiery sea of glass playing their harps singing these songs because they came out of the tribulation and now they're with Jesus boy that would be something to sing and shout about wouldn't it the Lord brought them through the most horrific time that we can't even describe through the tribulation and God now has them at his throne but there's a fiery surface now because the blood of many of them represents the, what they went through on earth. And so verse 5 says, And after this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And verse 6, And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure white linen, with golden sashes across their chest. And where do these seven angels with seven plagues come from? Out of the sanctuary or the heavenly temple. And how are they dressed? Notice how they're dressed. In pure, bright linen. This represents their holiness and their purity. They have the golden bands. Can you just see that beautiful golden band starting here on the shoulder and going to their waist? Running that from shoulder to waist. This signifies a priest so this shows they are of the priesthood of the Lord and they are royal and powerful priests preparing 
by the Lord prepared them to pour out the wrath of God on the earth. So the seven angels coming forth, the seven priestly angels coming forth, and they're doing the very worst judgment of all. They're pouring cups, not saucers, cups, and the cups are at the very brim of the cup. And so verse 7 says, And one of the four living creatures, remember who they are, one of them gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And now one of the four living creatures who's always around the throne, he will be used to give these bowls to the seven angels and these bowls are full of the wrath of God. And verse eight, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary with until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Can you imagine that this is a heavenly temple and that temple of the tabernacle it was called is God's holy temple it has the holy place and it has the holy of holies so John sees this beautiful temple in heaven representing God's holy dwelling place and they now it is filled with smoke and when the four live one of the four living creatures gave the bowl of bowls of wrath to the seven angels look what happened the heavenly temple was filled with smoke has this ever happened before Yes, it has. When the tabernacle was finished by Moses, guess what happened? The temple was filled with this smoke. Another word for this smoke would be Shekinah glory. So great is the glory. You couldn't even enter into the, the building, the tabernacle that Moses made. And when Solomon finished that most elaborate, beautiful sanctuary temple, same thing happened. There was this strong, thick smoke, and another name was it, the Shekinah glory of God. The God that Shekinah glory represents God's glory, God's pleasure on the place, these places. And so the same scene is here. The heavenly temple was filled with the glory of God and from his power, and no man could enter it into that temple until the end of the plagues were poured out. And that's chapter 15. They introduce us into, into the next seven bold judgments. And we'll pick those up. It's just 11 o'clock. So we'll take a nice break and we'll come back and finish. You'll probably get out a little early today. So take a nice break, visit. Go to the restrooms. I think they're all repaired now. I hope. We'll just keep that up there, Cindy. Keep that up there.
Okay, let's gather back around. Let's finish up. You'll get out earlier today. Okay, you should have in front of you two handouts, handout number five and handout number six. This next week, you will not have as many handouts. So, but five and six will go along. We have the picture of the angels, the seven angels with the seven plagues or bowls of wrath. And let's move right into talking about each bowl that will be poured out. In verse 1, chapter 16 says, And then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so a voice from the heavenly temple, that is the voice of God. Remember, since no one was a even able to go into that heavenly temple because of the thick smoke and the Shekinah glory. So this has to be the voice of God and him alone. Now the earth is ripe for judgment. God has been patient, but he's a loving God and does not want any to perish. We know that about our Lord. But the time has come. He's ready to pour out on the earth the entire universal judgment of the seven bowls of wrath. And this will happen very rapidly, relentless in the outpouring of the wrath, poured out one after the another. Now on the screen, you have a chart of the seven bowl judgments. And it says, verse 2, so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped the image. We know exactly who was affected with this pouring out of this bowl. He poured it upon the earth, the angel did, and out came malignant sores on all the people of the world. And which people are judged? Those who have the mark of the beast on them. And they will be inflicted with incurable, open, oozing sores and great pain. These are reminiscent of the boils that plagued Egypt and afflicted Job. Now, I did make you a handout, number six, because many of these that I will talk about are reminiscent of those plagues that affected Egypt when Moses was trying to take the people out of Egypt. And so there, the seven bowls of judgment, uh, you'll see the plagues at the top and then the seven bowls, and some of those are very similar. And so, if you see number six says the boils on the livestock and animals, that was in Egypt. Now, the verse three says the second angel poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Reminds of the waters of the Nile River in Egypt when they turned to blood. And here the sea turned into blood. And so there was a great uh, contamination of the seas. And there will be the death and decay of billions of sea creatures. 80% of all living organisms live in the sea. So with this second uh, pouring of the wrath, they will all be, the judgment will be so uh, dire in that all the living creatures in the sea will die. Now in the trumpet judgments, if you remember, a third of the sea creatures died. But here, the entire sea and all of the creatures that live in it will die. Then you have verse 4 says, and the third angel, we're moving along through the angels, the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. Clean water, so this is the 
contamination of the water supply, the fresh water supply, so no clean water, and there's a great thirst of the people. But like the third trumpet targets the rivers and the streams of water, this is worldwide and attacks water sources. And it turns all the water sources to blood. And so this affects all the drinking water for the people who are living during the end of the tribulation. No fresh, clean drinking water. And verse 5 and 6 says, And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Now here's an announcement from an angel clarifying they have blood to drink. That's good. This is what they deserve is what they say. saying. So this, this angel is the angel over the charge of waters. And the, uh, it says, now you, O Lord, have given them blood to drink and they will deserve it. Why? Because they have killed the believers. They've killed all the preachers of the gospel. And God's judgment is fair and proper. The thick blood-like substance which the fresh waters have become is all that is available to drink. And so they have nothing to drink but the blood in the waters. And so they're saying, you drink the water, the blood in the waters, to avenge the deaths of all those people that you killed during this time. In verse 7, and I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. So the martyred tribulation saints or believers from the altar echoes the words of this angel reinforcing the truth that God is just in all his judgments. It's not something that he's trying to zap on you, but he is a God that is just in warning you. But then the time is here and judgment will fall. And so the saints from the altar are echoing these words. And verse 8 says, The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch the people with fire. Now, the sun gives us light and warmth and energy, but now it will become a deadly killer, and it will be a killer of the inhabitants, and they will face extreme, extreme heat. And guess what? There's no drinking water, and yet they're living in extreme heat. The sun's heat is intensified with this bold judgment. And how did the people respond? And this is sad. Verse 9. They were scorched by the fierce heat. And they cursed the name of God. And had, who had the power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. Sinners will refuse to repent during this time. Instead, they actually blaspheme God. They're so calloused and harden such depravity and darkness of the human heart that they did not repeat. And may I say this, this is the last time repentance is mentioned in the book of Revelation, the very last time. And verse 10 says, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of his beast and its kingdom and was plunged into darkness and people gnawed their tongues in anguish. So here we have this bowl is poured out on the throne or the kingdom of the Antichrist, his entire kingdom. It will, this darkness will cover the planet. The people will not be able to see the stars or the moon or the sun. This darkness will be similar to the darkness that covered the land of Egypt when Moses was trying to free the Hebrews. And may I remind you, there was a darkness that covered the land for three hours when Jesus hung on the cross. 
So a darkness that's worldwide during this tribulation period, unlike anything the world can even imagine or experience. And, and it says, and the people uh, gnawed their tongues and they cursed the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. They did not repent of their deeds. All they knew to do was curse the almighty God with all the preaching, all the uh, revelations about God, his beautiful God, and turn to him and live for him and be saved. They did not because of the depravity of mankind. So the people that follow the Antichrist and the false prophet will not repent but blame God for their affliction. And that really is not surprising to me when we see some of the people living in our universe today. And verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And guess what the next few scriptures are going to be about? Armageddon. It doesn't spell it out, but this is scriptures still on that war and campaign of Armageddon. Now, the Euphrates is mentioned five times in Revelation, and now the end, it forms that eastern boundary of the land God promised to Israel. So it's in the east, Euphrates. The Babylon is right there. Next week, I'm going to find a picture of a map to show you where Babylon is located, and you'll see the Euphrates River along the side of that place of Babylon. Now, what happened when the angel poured uh, the bowl on the river? It dried up the whole river. So why? This is for the invasion of the kings of the east to be able to cross over that riverbed and assemble together for the Battle of Armageddon. And that's where the kings and their armies will fight this war of Armageddon. And how many men crossed over? 200 million men hoard against Israel in the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, this is a demonically inspired military force. And who are the kings of the East? Well, some scholars think they're China, North Korea, India, Japan, and others. These nations will come together to attack Israel. And this, arm, this army will do, be a battle against God, all these nations. This is not just an isolated battle, but a campaign that extends the last half of the tribulation period. In verse 13, and I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. Now these unclean spirits are demons, especially vile, powerful, very deceitful, and they're where are they coming from? Out of the mouth of the dragon, who is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast who is always the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And so that's an unholy trinity. And that's where these spirit demons are coming from. And this is the unholy trinity. These demonic spirits or plagues coming from uh, the, these mouths, they lure the world's kings to bring them to battle. They, these demons, will induce the kings to make this journey in spite of what they've suffered thus far with these wraths poured out. Uh, this intense heat and drought and darkness, they will persuade these uh, demons, will lure the kings through uh, magical ways, and they'll persuade the kings of the whole world together, 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 in a large, enormous army to fight against God Almighty. And verse 14 says, for they are demonic spirits performing signs, and they perform great signs, and they fool many people through the power of Satan, 
He's able to do that. He has the power to do that. And they who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on that great day of God Almighty. And now the kings of the earth are no longer just the eastern confederacy of Israel, but now the whole world gathers to Israel for the final climatic battle. And this battle is called Armageddon. Now, these demonic spirits will use miraculous signs to lure the leaders of the world into a death trap called the Great Day of God. Why do na nations gather at the Armageddon? Why are they able to lure the kings of the nations to this one place? So that the armies are gathered to finally eradicate and totally destroy the Jewish people. This campaign has been energized by Satan. It will be his last effort to get rid of the Jews and thwart the promise of God. This will be the final anti-Semitic, satanic surge to rid the people and the world of the Jewish people. He's always done that from the very beginning. This is his last try. And so, behold, he says, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one, that's another blessing, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Now, what is this telling us, this scripture? Well, it's another beatitude. This is an encouragement for the people to remain faithful. This is a reference to the coming of Jesus on that white stallion at the end of the seven years. Can't wait to get to that chapter. At the end of Armageddon, Jesus comes back and ends this battle. He will return and catch them all by surprise. And that's why he says, be vigilant to the timing of his return. These garments he's referring to to keep on, these are the righteousness, the righteous garments of Christ and those who refuse the mark of the beast will be blessed when Jesus Christ comes and they will not be exposed and the last verse and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon the Hebrew name for Mount Megiddo is a plain in Palestine that has been the site of many battles in history 60 miles north of Jerusalem. The battle will rage. It could be understand, understood to be the last decisive clash of good and evil on the last day. It's the Battle of Armageddon. will not be limited j just to the area and the battlefield of Megiddo, but it will encompass the entire uh, length of Israel for this battle. And so the seventh bowl is the last, and it says, uh, just follow along in your Bible with me, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. And the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. And great hailstorms, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on the people. And look what they did. And they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. Almighty Father God, thank you for this, these scriptures, Lord. Thank you. They are very foreboding. Nothing but doom, doom, doom. But it is your word, and we believe your word. It is a warning for us. 
Thank you for the seriousness of these chapters, O oh Lord. It is a reminder that we're not in charge. Thank goodness we are not in charge, but you are. You're in charge of us. You're in charge of the world. You're in charge of all the issues of the world in our lives, Lord. May we remember that chapter 4, that you're on that throne, and you have directed all of these judgments on mankind. And you have mapped out a plan that will ultimately bring glory to your name. And we realize that we must fit into your plan. I pray for all of us who have given our lives to you that we may live our lives in gratitude to you for being our Savior. We commit our days to you in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Next week, 17, 18. And I hope everyone's receiving my emails. All right. Cindy usually gets it all from me. <laughs>
Downside out? 